world news tonight. Nuclear disaster. The conflict in Ukraine has reached a pivotal standpoint which has brought the warring nations closer to a nuclear catastrophe. Fingers are being pointed to both sides as Russia boasts its military prowess to the world. Extra powers. Former Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison is under attack as new information services on his expanded portfolio during the time of governance. Tonight, we look into the latest developments and reactions. Kenya's leadership. A chaotic election result announcement has been followed with tense events in Kenya as multiple parties cast doubts on the final decision. And lighting up. Scotland's skies have been met with one of nature's most incredible sights, striking fear and awe to the public. This is Ada Derano World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Danidu Witanawasam. Good evening and welcome to World News. A lot to report to you tonight and we start off from the situation in Ukraine. Now Ukraine has called for new sanctions on Russia as shelling close to a nuclear power plant has raised concerns and accusations against both sides due to an impending disaster. Meanwhile, President Putin has claimed that Russia's latest arms are far superior to that of its rival nations. Ukraine's president called for new sanctions against Russia on Monday as he warned of the consequences of a potential catastrophe at the Zaporizhia nuclear plant. Shelling near the plant, Europe's largest, has caused widespread alarm, with the world nuclear watchdog warning that there could be a disaster if the fighting does not stop. New satellite imagery released by Planet Labs purports to show the aftermath of shelling near the plant which Russia seized in March. Ukrainian and Russian installed officials have traded accusations over who is responsible for the attacks. In a late night Monday address, Vladimir Zelensky called for Russia's nuclear sector to be sanctioned. If a terrorist state allows itself to completely ignore the international community's demands and furthermore on such a sensitive topic, this clearly indicates the need for immediate action. Any radiation incident at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant can be a blow to the countries of the European Union, Turkey, Georgia and countries from more distant regions. Everything depends only on the direction and strength of the wind. If Russia's actions lead to a catastrophe, the consequences may hit those who yet remain silent. Meanwhile, a Russian-backed court in Ukraine's Donetsk charged five Europeans on Monday with being mercenaries. The men from Britain, Croatia and Sweden were captured while fighting with Ukrainian forces. Russian media reports that three of them could face the death penalty. All have pleaded not guilty. Foreign governments have dismissed the trials as illegitimate. In June, three other foreign nationals were sentenced to death on similar charges. Russia sent troops into Ukraine in February in what it calls a special military operation to demilitarize its neighbor. Ukraine and its Western backers accuse Moscow of waging an imperial-style war of conquest. Over the election in Kenya, Kenya's Electoral Commission announced William Ruto as winner of the East African country's presidential election amid chaotic scenes, including some commission officials disowning the result. Kenya's deputy president, William Ruto, has won the country's presidential election, the Electoral Commission said on Monday. But it was an announcement made amid chaotic scenes, with scuffles breaking out and Electoral Commission officials disowning the results. Juliana Torreira, the Electoral Commission's deputy chairperson, told a media briefing that she and three other commissioners were not able to take ownership of the results. Because of the opaque nature which these results have been handled. Minutes later at the announcement hall, the head of the Electoral Commission, Wafula Chibukati, took to the stage to announce the result. <laughs> Diplomats and international observers had been hurried out moments before. Fights had also broken out as supporters of Ruto's main opponent, Raila Odinga, rushed the stage. Chibukati said Ruto had passed the 50% threshold needed to win the presidency. 7,176,141. Odinga did not attend the announcement. Ruto hailed the Electoral Commission as heroes and said there is no looking back. We are looking to the future. 
but the manner in which the result was announced will add to fears that the past could be about to repeat. Kenya has a history of post-election violence. More than 1,200 people died following a vote in 2007. 100 were killed after an election a decade later. In Kisumu, an Odinga stronghold in western Kenya, the reaction was immediate. Several black plumes of smoke rose around a roundabout as people burned piles of tires. Police fired tear gas at protesters amid shouts of Chibukati must go and no Ryla, no peace. Now, with the ban on Russian coal imports to Europe, South Africa seems to be a heavy beneficiary as the soil and profits are witness for its coal exports. Ahead of, ahead of the ban, European countries, which previously imported 45% of their coal from Russia and have been switching away from expensive natural gas to coal, started to source the fossil fuel from other countries, including South Africa. South Africa's coal sales to Europe rose eightfold in the first half of 2022 as demand surged ahead of a ban on imports of the fossil fuel from Russia. That's according to Johannesburg-based coal exporter Tungela Resources, which on Monday reported half-year profits 20 times larger than the year before. The boost was driven by Tungela's realized average price rising to $240 per ton during the half year to June 30th, compared to $75 a ton last year because of the higher demand. Adopted. In April, the European Union announced a ban on coal imports from Russia as part of sanctions over the war in Ukraine. It came into effect on August 10th, but ahead of the ban, European countries, which previously relied on Russia for 45% of their coal, began sourcing elsewhere. Tungela said Europe was competing with Asia for South African coal. The company is part of a consortium that owns Africa's largest coal export facility, the Richards Bay Coal Terminal. Tungela's chief financial officer Dion Smith said coal exports from the RBCT had risen by 720% year-on-year to around 4.5 million U.S. tons in the first half of 2022. But CEO July Nudlovo said South Africa was not able to take full advantage because of its deteriorating rail infrastructure. Poor maintenance, a lack of locomotives and copper cable theft have diminished the capacity of state-owned rail company Transnet. As a result of the difficulties in getting coal to port, Tungela has revised down its production guidance for 2022. The company, which was spun off from mining giant Anglo-American in June last year, said it would return 8.2 billion rand, or a little over $500 million, to shareholders. Over to Australia now, former Prime Minister Scott Morrison, who stepped down as leader of the Liberal Party after losing a general election in May, has come under fire from senior members of his own party and his coalition partner, the National Party, who were unaware of the arrangements. After a review of the matter by the Prime Minister's department, current Prime Minister Albanese told reporters Morrison had taken on the health and finance portfolios in March 2020, Home Affairs and Treasury in May 2021, and Resources in April 2021. The Prime Minister will receive legal advice on the issue from the Solicitor General and said he was critical of Morrison government for allowing a centralization of power by the Prime Minister. Morrison defended taking on the extra portfolios, saying they were a safeguard during the coronavirus pandemic and that he would have made the appointments public had he needed to use the powers involved. Now France pulled the last of its troops out of Mali, bringing the country's Operation Barkane to an end. Dealings with the ruling junta in Bamako have been on tumultuous ground for some time, with France withdrawing soldiers from Mali over recent months at the insistence of the authorities there. As the last of France's troops pulled out of Mali Monday, there was no fanfare. After almost a decade of them fighting Islamist extremists in the country as part of Operation Barkhane, Malians say the French soldiers won't be missed. People haven't understood that if France leaves or stays, it won't change anything. When French troops first arrived in 2013, it was a different story. They were held as heroes, sent to free Mali from the growing jihadist threat. Today, relations between Paris and Bamako are at an all-time low, after France's presence in the country became increasingly unpopular with the Malian government and the public. President Emmanuel Macron quickly announced the withdrawal of 2,400 French troops in April after the fallout. Along with relations with France, security in Mali has also deteriorated, 
a worry that remains in the mind of Malians. Let us remain on our guard because the terror threat is still there. Mali continues to be plagued by the Islamist insurgency. It's now spread to the center of the country and across the border into neighboring Niger and Burkina Faso. But Bamako remains determined to eliminate the threat. We have to work hard to fill this void. It's up to us Malians to work hand in hand to fill this void. It's a void that Russian mercenaries from the Wagner Group are also set to fill. The group with suspected links to the Kremlin has been given the green light by Mali's transitional government to set up camp on its territory, a move that has angered France. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Now, China's military had stated that it carried out more exercises near Taiwan yesterday as a group of U.S. lawmakers visited the Chinese-claimed island and met President Tsai Ing-wen, who said the government was committed to maintaining stability. Just 12 days after Nancy Pelosi's controversial visit to Taiwan, another group of U.S. lawmakers arrived unannounced on the island nation's shores. Five members of a bipartisan congressional delegation met with President Tsai Ing-wen on Monday morning for talks believed to be on trade, regional security and climate change. The meeting has been hailed by Taiwan's foreign ministry. Their visit proves that China can't stop politicians from any country visiting Taiwan. And it also sends an important message that America stands with the Taiwanese people. But Beijing has called it a case of opportunism ahead of the American midterm elections, while lambasting Taiwan's ruling Democratic Progressive Party. The visit comes as China continues a military intimidation campaign against Taiwan. Beijing responded to House Speaker Pelosi's visit by launching unprecedented military exercises around the island, which it said it completed on Wednesday. However, the People's Liberation Army is still sending fighter jets and warships close to Taiwan in what Taipei and Washington have condemned as an attempt to change the status quo. A U.S. representative, Liz Cheney, had voted to impeach the former president for the January 6th United States Capitol attack. Now, Wyoming Republicans will decide her political fate. Nearly every House Republican who supported Trump's second impeachment and ran for re-election this year faced a Trump-backed challenger. There may be no greater political antagonist to Donald Trump than Liz Cheney. This is Donald Trump's legacy, but it cannot be the future of our nation. Trump, in turn, has declared her re-election campaign to be his biggest target. She really represents despicable things. Cheney voted to impeach him after the insurrection at the Capitol last year and is now vice chair of the January 6th Select Committee. President Trump summoned a mob to Washington for January 6th. But back home in the deep red state of Wyoming, she's on the cusp of losing. Vowing to oust her from office, fellow Republican Harriet Hageman a land use attorney backed by the former president. We're fed up with Liz Cheney. Liz, you're fired. Get out of here. Now, Cheney needs help from Democrats. And the multiple investigations into Donald Trump have not moved many Republican voters. In the final days before the vote, Cheney turning for help from her famous father, who first won this very congressional seat 44 years ago. Now an update on the brutal attack on novelist Salman Rushdie. Iran distanced itself from the attacker who stabbed author Salman Rushdie and claimed instead that Rushdie himself was to be blamed for the incident for integrating the world's Muslim population. Iran's government on Monday said that the vicious knife attack that landed novelist Salman Rushdie in the hospital was the fault of the author and his supporters, not the Islamic Republic. In Iran's first official statement since the attack, Iranian Foreign Ministry spokesperson Nasser Kanani said freedom of speech did not justify Rushdie's insults against religion. We don't see any other parties who should be blamed or condemned, other than his own person and his supporters. Freedom of expression of ideas and such similar slogans cannot justify insults against religious beliefs and fundamentals of Islam. Writers and politicians around the world have condemned the attack. The 75-year-old Rushdie was stabbed repeatedly on stage last week at an event in Chautauqua in upstate New York. 
Rushdie rose to fame with the 1988 novel The Satanic Verses, which some Muslim religious authorities deemed blasphemous and prompted Iran's supreme leader to issue a fatwa, or edict, calling on Muslims to kill the novelist and anyone involved in the book's publication. Living with a bounty on his head, the Indian-born Rushdie became a symbol of artistic freedom in the face of state repression and religious censorship. This is an issue of religious terrorism. A man with a knife cannot silence a man with a pen. New York State Governor Kathy Hochul on Sunday traveled to Chautauqua and condemned the attack. Mr. Rushdie spent more than a decade of his life in hiding and finally said, no more, I'm coming out. I'm coming out of the shadows. I will not be bowed by fear or a threat. And to those of us who go about our daily lives, if that's not an inspiration, I don't know what is. Rushdie was about to deliver a lecture at the Chautauqua Institution in western New York on the importance of the United States as a haven for targeted artists when police say a 24-year-old man rushed the stage and stabbed him. The author was airlifted to a hospital in Rochester. His agent told that Rushdie had sustained severe injuries, including nerve damage to his arm and wounds to his liver, and was likely to lose an eye. The suspect, Hadi Matar of New Jersey, pleaded not guilty to attempted murder and assault on Saturday. We don't have any information about the individual who carried out this action other than what's been reported in the U.S. media. Iran on Monday denied any association with the alleged attacker. In 1998, the Iranian government said the fatwa on Rushdie was over. But just three years ago, Iranian Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei tweeted that the edict was, quote, irrevocable. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said on Sunday that Iranian state institutions had incited violence against Rushdie for generations, and state-affiliated media had gloated about the attempt on his life. More news on Iran. Iran responded to the European Union's final draft text to save a 2015 nuclear deal. An EU official has stated that as the Iranian foreign minister called on the United States to show flexibility to resolve three remaining issues. According to Washington, there's nothing more to negotiate, as both Iran and the U.S. were expected to give responses to what the European Union called a final text aimed at reviving the 2015 nuclear deal. The State Department warned Tehran against pushing its luck. The only way to achieve a mutual return to compliance uh, with the JCPOA is for Iran to drop uh, further unacceptable demands that go beyond the scope of the JCPOA. Uh, we have long called these demands uh, extraneous. The EU drafted the proposal last week, saying there was no more space for negotiations or compromise. For over a year, the bloc has facilitated discussions to try to save the JCPOA after it was quashed in 2018 with the withdrawal of then US President Donald Trump. Now, Iran wants binding guarantees that no other administration will be able to pull out of a revived deal, though this could prove tricky because the agreement is not a legally binding treaty. If America shows that it's willing to be flexible and realistic, then in the next few days we can reach an agreement. But if it doesn't, it's not the end of the world. The JCPOA aims to curb Iran's nuclear program in return for relief from U.S., EU and U.N. sanctions. Analysts say both Tehran and Washington have compelling reasons to keep the pact alive, but admit neither side is willing to make concessions that would see it reinstated. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Starbucks has accused the National Labor Relations Board of manipulating employee elections to unionize and has requested those elections to be suspended pending the outcome of an investigation. A year ago, none of the nearly 9,000 corporate-owned Starbucks locations in the U.S. were unionized. U.S. stocks rose with mega-cap growth shares, extending the market's recent rally amid investor optimism the Federal Reserve can achieve a soft landing for the economy. Shares of Apple Inc. climbed 0.6% while Microsoft Incorporated rose by 0.5% and Tesla by 3.1%. Rudy Giuliani said that he is a target in a criminal probe in Georgia examining attempts by former President Donald Trump and his allies to overturn the election. Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade alerted Giuliani's local attorney in Atlanta that the former New York City mayor could face criminal charges. 
The UK has become the first country to authorize a COVID-19 vaccine tailored to the Omicron variant, setting the stage for an autumn booster campaign using Moderna's two-strain shot. The Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Authority, which was the first in the world to approve an original COVID-19 jab, has granted conditional authorization to the vaccine, which targets both the original strain of the virus and Omicron BA. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news from around the globe. If you have missed any of the stories we aired tonight, you can re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We are leaving you tonight with an eyewitness capture of the moment of dramatic lightning strike twisted through the sky over the Scottish town of Dundee. Thank you for joining us. Have a great night.